Disney Pixar's Up is known for a lot of things. The intro sequence, the annoying dog, but one thing that's often forgotten is Carl's steadfast insistence to be a holdout. And Carl was real. Well, at least his story was. Similar to Edith Mayfield's last stand against developers in Seattle, holdouts are seen as an inspirational act of defiance and preservation. But in New York City, where construction and change is endless, it's the developer's worst nightmare. They buy a building and they want to tear it down, but a rent-controlled tenant who's well within their right won't leave their apartment and they refuse any and all buyout offers. And typically uh, a holdout tenant has a case when they are in a, a rent uh, stabilized or rent controlled apartment. Uh, there are certain protections under those rules that would allow them to uh, continue their tenancy in some cases. And much to the chagrin of, of the developer because they can't force them out. And so you get these uh, standoffs where the, uh, the holdout doesn't want to go and there isn't much that the uh, developer can do to force them to go. Be it stubbornness, sentimentality, or just downright greed. New York holdouts have been motivated by all kinds of reasons in the last century. I really feel that it's mostly about just not wanting to lose a place where you've lived and made your life. It's kind of like you're shouting to the world, you know, I'm here and I'm staying. The lengths to which developers will coerce landlords and tenants to leave is staggering. They have and will offer hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of dollars for them to give up their home. I think New York is kind of a prime city for these sort of whole life situations to happen because it has relatively strong uh, rental protections for tenants. The history of holdouts can be, well, daunting to research. Andrew Alpern's fascinating book, Holdouts, highlights about 50 cases over the last 100 years. It opened the door to an entire world of decades-long feuds and back alley deals. Three stories in particular really caught my eye and all three of them are kind of special in their own right. The most notorious and noticeable, the one that prompted the largest buyout ever recorded in the city's history, and the one that resulted in the smallest piece of private property in the five boroughs. We'll start with New York's most notorious, Macy's flagship store in Manhattan's Herald Square. On first glance, it doesn't quite look complete, and there's a reason for that. This spot has been called the most contentious corner in New York by the New York Post. The million dollar corner story began back in 1900 with a battle between two major department stores, Macy's and the Siegel Cooper Company. Macy's, whose flagship store was on 14th Street at the time, wanted to move up to 34th Street and purchase the entire block to create the world's largest store. It's said that Siegel Cooper, whose 18th Street store was already touted as the world's largest, caught wind of this and, determined to thwart Macy's plans, convinced a local store owner to purchase the corner store for $375,000. Fast forward about 100 years, and the end result is Macy's kind of awkward shopping bag atop what is now a sunglass hut. It's the only piece on the entire block that's not owned by Macy's. 100 years and 27 blocks further uptown, another holdout story unfolded, involving $17 million and a tenant named Herb. It was 2004 and developers Will and Arthur Zeckenford had just purchased the Mayflower Hotel and intended to tear it down. All of the tenants had left but Herb. Refusing to leave, he was the sole occupant of a 52,000 square foot property. He stated that he liked his 350 square foot studio and all he wanted was a view of Central Park. The end result after many lawyer calls, the Zeckendorfs not only bought Herb a fully furnished $2 million two bedroom condo, but also gave him a $17 million check, making it the largest recorded buyout and relocation in New York City history. And Herb got his Central Park view. Our last story takes place around 1910 and in the heart of Greenwich Village. In order to build the 7th Avenue subway extension, the city, wielding the power of eminent domain, was planning to demolish nearly 300 buildings. David Hess, landlord of the five-story apartment building, the Voorhees, was in the way though. He refused to sell, but eminent domain allows governmental bodies to expropriate private property if the land is to be used for public use. Mr. Hess didn't have a case, and his building was torn down. However, when the city seized this building, the survey had missed this 27 and a half by 27 and a half by 25 and a half inch piece of land. 
Realizing their mistake, the city asked the Hess family for it, to which they vehemently refused. Thus, the smallest piece of private property in New York City was born. Like the Hess Triangle itself, holdouts often become iconic in their neighborhoods. If and when a holdout succeeds and a new building goes up around it, the property, sometimes seen as an awkward eyesore, can become far less desirable. Thus, they generally stick around for another construction cycle. The holdout building becomes um, a, a landmark in itself. It becomes, uh, it's like a personification, a, a memorial of the old city. We're very emotionally invested in the buildings in our neighborhoods. There might be an old, decrepit, you know, brownstone or former carriage house or something that's been in your neighborhood for years and years, and you don't want to see it go. You know, we all accept the march of progress, but then when it's on your own block, you don't like it necessarily. As for New York City holdouts, it doesn't seem like they're going anywhere, just like the tenants themselves. I think we're going to continue to see holdout scenarios in New York City because it, it's just sort of a feature of the New York real estate market. I think that New Yorkers tend to cheer holdouts on. Uh, they really like the idea. It's the underdog versus the big guy. Uh, the idea of somebody uh, pushing back and then winning out over a developer. Um, it's a good story, you know, and it makes you just cheer them on. Are you for or against holdouts? Do you know of any in your neighborhood? Let us know in the comments below.